It's time once again to take a journey. So turn on the lights, pull your chair up, get a little closer and get ready, because the journey's about to begin. You turn your radio on and there it is, a faint station, wafting in and out of the static of the night. A man named Eric, running a show called The Midnight Cafe, calls to you. The conversation seems strange at first, but as you listen, as his voice fades in and out of the static, you realize this is where you were meant to be. This is what you were meant to listen to. We will take a journey that takes us from the normal, well, all the way through to the paranormal and beyond. We'll talk about the knowns and the unknowns and everything in between. And together, perhaps we'll make a little sense out of this crazy world we all live in. Welcome. Welcome, my friends, to another episode of the Midnight Cafe. I'm your host, Eric. And for the next hour, we'll be discussing the news, maybe a little bit of paranormal news. And our main topic for this evening, the Bermuda Triangle. What's going on down there in the Bermuda Triangle? We'll cover that and more. We'll also get to a whole bunch of really cool songs, this week specializing in the big band era. That's all coming up right now. But first, let's get to the news. Like most weeks, we start our news this week with news from outer space. And this is one I probably should have covered a week or so ago. But there were other things going on, and this is the story of Voyager 1. If you're not familiar with the Voyager spacecraft, two of them were launched, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, back in 1977, and they were going to take a tour of some of the outer planets. 1977, just think about that. Well, they did, and they did a great job of doing it, so much so that they decided to continue their mission with one, Voyager 2, heading off in one direction, and the other, Voyager 1, heading off towards the edges of our solar system. In 2012, it left the heliosphere, which is what we widely consider to be the edge of our solar system, and continued on into deep space. It's so far away that it takes over 20 hours to send a signal or receive a signal from the craft, but it continues to send back data. And that's where this week's mystery comes into place. It's sending back some unusual data, data that doesn't make any sense. There is a theory that this is being caused by some sort of circuitry issue on board. But the system was really well designed. There's a lot of backups. And the system is also designed to detect when there is an issue. So far, that has not occurred. It does a self-check, it says everything's fine, and then it continues to send back random or bad data. We're not giving up hope on the Voyager 1, that's for sure, but we are trying to figure out why it's giving us this interesting data. Is it some sort of new cosmic radiation that we're just not familiar with that's causing this new set of issues? It's really interesting because this is as far out as any man-made object, that we know of anyway, has traveled in our solar system, or outside of it, I should say. It's going to be an interesting to see how this plays out. There there are teams that have been working on the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 all the way since its launch. There are a lot of people who are definitely rooting for Voyager 1 to continue to work well into, well, 2077, if such a thing is possible. We'll keep an eye on it, and I'll let you know what becomes of the Voyager 1. In the meantime, Voyager 2 is still working beautifully. It's a little closer in. It only takes 18 hours to get a message out to Voyager 2. And so even if Voyager 1 does finally give up the ghost, well, Voyager 2 will continue the mission. Let's go on to world news. And the world news tonight is not great, but really honestly not bad. I think we're looking at a nothing burger, although not a nothing burger for those people who are affected by it. And that is monkeypox, which has kind of popped up out of nowhere. It appears to be rolling slowly through most countries, now reporting at least one or two cases here in the United States. 13 states with confirmed cases. But this is not like coronavirus. This takes a little more direct contact in order to spread. 
And there are treatments for monkeypox that are already on the books. In fact, some people are saying that it's possible that the smallpox vaccination can offer some resistance to the monkeypox. I'm not uh, going to get deep into these kinds of stories, but I did want to make a note of it this week. It's a, Like I said, it kind of came out of the gate as a big deal. But the more rational people start thinking, the more they realize that this is not going to be the next COVID. And we can all be thankful for that. And in U.S. news tonight, this is kind of sad in a way, but it is something that I wanted to cover. I read it off of MSN, and I will quote parts of the article. don't want people to get the wrong opinion here. I'm going to take this at a more comical way. But it says here that uh, trust in the U.S. government has fallen to near all-time lows. 20% approval rating. That's that's hard to do. You really got to work at that, you know. And this is in contrast to 1964 when Americans gave the same government, right, the government a 77% approval rating. Think about that. 1964 a 77% approval rating, and now merely 20%. That's pretty rough. This research comes from the Pew Research Center, and it was released this past week. This low rating, they say, uh, reflects decades of distrust and mistrust in the government. They say it's a sentiment that has changed very little since former President George W. Bush's second term in office. So you look at that, you read that main line there, that main paragraph, and you think, oh, boy. Boy, this is not good. But the truth is, in a lot of ways, government, if you look deeper into the data here, public trust of the government is good, or public approval of the government is good in many ways. But it's when places like this, and this is where they point out, uh, lower-income families, middle-income families, and retirees, they make up the bulk of the people in this report that gave very, very low ratings. They said that when government works better for, you know, when you feel like government is working for you, and in this case, apparently lower income, middle income, and retirees just don't feel like the government is is doing enough for them. And I'm not really sure what the government is supposed to do for us at all, but it is interesting to see that those numbers apparently could come up or should come up if more action is taken to protect those classes of people. But for right now... (laughs) You know, looking at this rating here at 20%, there's not a whole lot farther down you can go. And let's hope that the U.S. government doesn't uh, doesn't find a way to do so. <laughs> you know, I'm rooting for him. So pretty good, interesting. And moving on to uh, financial news, that there really isn't any good news from last week to this week. There are more and more signs of a recession coming. There was the first housing slowdown reported in uh, several states here in the United States. And that is not a good sign. We have had a market that has been literally on fire. And the way that they're tracking this is not home sales, but they're looking at mortgage applications. And so for the first time in quite a few years, we're seeing a dip. That is probably an indication that things are starting to go bad in some areas of the country. Although this just being a little blip on the radar, it's not possible to say for certain that we are seeing the end of the ride upward. I got my fingers crossed that the economy continues to thrive and does better in 2022 and 2023, but I'm tempering my bets and also preparing for the possibility of a recession. You should too, my friends. You should too. If you're paying attention to things, if you're looking at inflation, if you're looking at job markets and job opportunities, well, things don't look good right now, but let's hope together and maybe let's pray together that things turn around. Lastly, tonight, we go to paranormal news, or just out of the ordinary news, I guess. And that is this article from the New York Times suggesting that reports of UFO sightings surged during the pandemic. I read this article, and it dawned on me that this really didn't stick out as that unusual. A lot of people, those that were not essential workers, found themselves with a lot more free time. Some people lost their jobs. What do you do with your free time? You find things to do. Camping in the summer, sitting out on the porch at night, you don't have to get up early to go to work. It didn't surprise me at all that they saw a lot more sightings of UFOs. I don't think that you could say that this had anything to do in particular with an uptick in UFO activity here across the world. I just feel like more eyes were on the skies. It's interesting to note that this story really doesn't dispute what people saw. It just goes on to say that uh, 
with a little bit less light pollution and noise pollution. After dark, people were able to see more of the night sky. And when they saw more, well, they saw things that they had never seen before. Kind of interesting. We're going to go right to a song, and when we come back, we're going to start talking about our main topic for the week. That is the Bermuda Triangle. An interesting place with lots of stories to tell. We're going to play some great music from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, maybe even the 20s. And we'll start off with this one right here on WBCQ 7490. You're listening to the Midnight Cafe. Let's go. Now that, my friends, is a great song. That was Glenn Miller's Sing, 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 and man, what a tune. If you don't want to get up and dance when that song is played, I think there might be something wrong with you. (laughs) But let's get on to tonight's main topic, and that topic is the Bermuda Triangle. Most of you, I would hope, have at least heard of the Bermuda Triangle, also sometimes referred to as the Devil's Triangle. And it is a area, loosely defined area, of western North Atlantic Ocean. There are a number of aircraft and ships that have disappeared in this area under mysterious circumstances, and a lot of the disappearances did occur in the mid-20th century, but we still do see the occasional vanishing. Tonight we're going to get into some of the reasons why these things may have happened. In fact, we even have a plausible theory as to what caused several of these things to happen, but there are some relatively famous cases that have yet to have a rational explanation. And it's an interesting place to visit. It's, you know, it goes from the southern tip of Florida to the Bermuda Islands and then down towards Puerto Rico, and uh, and that's pretty much the triangle. The, and there's a lot of islands, the Bahamas, there's a lot of small places there, a lot of countries there. And so there's a vast area of water there, so it it makes you wonder if some of these things are happening that are natural and some things are happening that are not natural. What I do find interesting is, and this is something we'll cover maybe in another night, also in the vicinity of the Bermuda Triangle, about a, I think it was 2008 or 2009, they located a underground, underwater pyramid complex, a beautifully, I mean, the rendition of it off of sonar, it was pretty unmistakable, three pyramids and a whole bunch of structures. What is doesn't make any sense about that finding is that it is 500 feet underwater. So whatever occurred there, we're not looking at, you know, global climate change or the natural ebb and flow of currents and tides. We're looking at something that would have heaved a large portion of the earth up and unfortunately sank that portion of the earth down. Another mystery for another night, my friends. But back to the Bermuda Triangle. It's uh, it's a place of many mysteries, no doubt. Some of these can probably be determined to be weather-related losses, but the earliest suggestion of these disappearances that occur in Bermuda that I could come up with was in 1950. And then Fate Magazine, which is no longer in print, also used to say, used to do reports on it. I remember as a kid uh, going through my grandfather's old uh, copies of this. This was a really cool magazine from way back in the day. But what I remember, my first memory, is the U.S. Navy training squadron that got lost and has never been found to this day. It's it's an Avenger torpedo bombers, if I remember correctly. And these bombers went out on a training mission and reported back, they were still within radio comms of the Florida base that they flew out of, that they were having issues with the Compass. And this is where the Bermuda Triangle gets really interesting because we're looking at compasses here. These are magnetic devices. What would cause, what magnetic phenomenon would cause these compasses to, on all the planes, There's again, there was more than one plane on this flight, and what would cause all of them to simultaneously become non-functional or irrationally working? That part I loved when reading about this for the first time. They were, however, able to communicate back to the base and they were attempting to get back and unfortunately you know they just weren't able to find their bearings uh they weren't able to use the sun to give them an idea of where they were going and if you think about the ocean and its vastness it wouldn't be too hard to imagine that a few hundred miles worth of fuel could easily be burned up traveling in the wrong direction before realizing you had made a fatal mistake 
At some point, they lost communication with base, and they did send out yet another plane. That plane also disappeared. And that is a pretty interesting way to start the night. That is where we start. So what do you think happened to the Avenger torpedo bombers on that training mission? We'll get a little deeper into it here in a bit, but I just want to touch on that one. But talk about how there's so many more. There's ships that just dis- disappear. Well, you know, calm waters, no storms in sight, and then suddenly all radar contact is lost and the ship is gone, never to be seen again. Are we looking at perhaps a trans-dimensional spot? Are we looking at some place where you slip into another reality or slip out of reality? Or are we looking at a natural phenomenon that is more difficult to explain, something that we just haven't seen enough to understand? Certainly the magnetic issue with those compasses leads me to believe that Perhaps there was some kind of solar activity. Maybe the ozone layer opened up. Who knows what could have gone on there to cause all that kind of electromagnetic issue. Perhaps there was a different organization in the military that was testing out new equipment that caused this to happen. I guess we'll never know, and that is part of the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. Let's get a little deeper into that story of the loss of a group of five torpedo bombers. Flight 19 was the designation of a group of five General Motors TBM Avenger torpedo bombers. These bombers disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle on December 5, 1945. They did so after losing contact with a U.S. Navy base while on a training mission for an overwater navigation training flight. They had flown out of the Naval Air Force Station at Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and all 14 of the guys and gals, I guess it would have just been guys back then, on this flight were lost, as were all 13 crew members of a Martin PBM Mariner Flying Bolt that subsequently launched from the same airbase to search for Flight 19. We're looking at a pretty heavy-duty loss here, all in a single day, and no one knows to this day what went wrong. The Navy did their own investigation, and like a lot of Navy investigations, they concluded that the flight leader... Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor mistook small islands offshore for the Florida Keys after his compasses stopped working. This resulted in the flight heading over open sea and away from land, causing their ultimate demise. The report, though, was later amended by the Navy to read, Cause Unknown, to avoid blaming Taylor for the loss of these five aircraft and 14 men. That report attributed the loss of the aircraft to an explosion in midair while searching for the flight. Now, during the time of this flight and after both the compasses on his plane went bad, Lieutenant Taylor did communicate both with base and with his fellow pilots. They made some changes to course as they continued to find themselves lost, flying in one direction and then another. When one commented, if we could just fly west, we would get home. Let's head west. There was a difference of opinion that led to them not doing the same thing. They They decided to follow Lieutenant Taylor's lead, and slowly their fuel became more and more of an issue. The weather also started to deteriorate, and this led to less and less radio contact between the planes and base. The last known communication talked about flying 270 degrees west until landfall or running out of gas. They also requested a weather check at 724, but they did not seem to receive that message. At that point, they were no longer able to communicate with base. They were still communicating, still still heard by base, but they weren't able they weren't able to respond. They weren't able to hear what was going on. At eighteen hundred hours, six p.m., Taylor radioed to his flight, holding at two seventy. We didn't fly far enough east. We may as well just turn around and fly east again. By that time, though, the weather had deteriorated even more, and the sun had also set. you got to remember, too, this is well before fly-by instruments was not something that was often done in the evenings. Around 1820, one of the bases picked up his last message. He was heard saying, all planes close up tight, we'll have to ditch and less landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. That was the last time anyone heard from Lieutenant Taylor or any of the other men on that flight. And we're left wondering, what did go on? Where did they land? Where were they on in that vast sea? We do know this. There was another flight that left 
A consolidated PBY Catalina departed at 6 o'clock looking for Flight 19 to help guide them back if they could be located. Now, this boat had a little bit better equipment and a much more trained crew, so they were able to fly after dark. They called in a routine radio message at 19.30, that would be 7.30 our time, but were never heard from again. So they, they went out looking for these people. They had a full tank. They had an experienced crew. And in less than an hour and a half, they were gone. At 21.15, the tanker SS Gaines Mill reported that it had observed flames from an apparent explosion leaping 100 feet high and burning for 10 minutes, and he gave a position. The captain, Mr. Stanley, reported unsuccessfully searching for survivors through a pool of oil and aviation gasoline. The escort carrier USS Solomons also reported losing radar contact with an aircraft at the same position and at the same time. So what caused that plane to explode midair? Was it the same phenomenon that caused the compasses to fail on Lieutenant Taylor's plane? Or was this some other phenomenon? Or was it just a case of extreme bad luck for both crews? It's very interesting. It's a very interesting story. It could be a tragedy of just error stacking up on top of themselves. If you've served in the military, you know that when things go wrong, they sometimes can go really, really wrong, really, really fast. So it wouldn't surprise me if this was just a non-paranormal event. But it is an interesting story. Let's go back to some music, and we'll talk some more about the Bermuda Triangle. Also, remember, you can get in touch with me at the Midnight Cafe at Hotmail.com. Love to hear your thoughts on this very interesting story we're talking about tonight, the Bermuda Triangle. You're listening to the Midnight Cafe right here on WBCQ 7490. All right. Continuing with our story for tonight, that was Benny Goodman and Big Band Swing. That's another 40s big band music. And I hope you're enjoying the oldies, a little detour from our normal music here. And that's part of the fun of the Midnight Cafe, though, is that occasionally I'll have a wild hair and decide to play something totally unrelated to what we normally play here. And that is tonight. And who knows what next week will bring music-wise. It's one of the reasons I hope you'll keep coming back to the Midnight Cafe here on WBCQ 7490. But now let's get on and get back to our main topic for the evening, and that is the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Well, we're going to move from the air, the last story we were talking about, to the sea. And this is the story of the USS Cyclops. Now, this is one of the most famous stories of a lost ship in the Bermuda Triangle. The Cyclops was a U.S. vessel. It was 550 foot long, one of the largest seagoing vessels of its time. It launched in 1911, so it was not a, a baby when it disappeared in 20, uh, 2018. No, 1918. So we're getting we're getting there. It's been over a hundred years since this thing went missing, and still no sign has been found of the Cyclops. It had a crew of 306 people when it went missing. It was also carrying 11,000 tons of manganese or magnesium. This was the ore used, and it was very important for World War I usage. So it had traveled from Brazil, where it loaded up, and was headed through the Caribbean when it went missing. It was interesting because this ship had traveled this course on more than one occasion. But on this night, when it disappeared, it just said one last segment. It just sent off a signal saying, hey, we have uh, just left Barbados for a resupply. I'm assuming food and fuel at that point because they already had picked up their tonnage in Brazil. But the ship's last signal said, weather fair, all well. But during this nine-day journey, something apparently wasn't well because no one ever saw or heard from the ship again. It vanished without even sending a single SOS to strikes signal. And that's kind of interesting because usually when a ship goes down, it doesn't just disappear. It takes on water, it rolls, whatever happens, there's usually some sort of an indication that something has gone terribly wrong. And on a ship the size of the Cyclops, something more should have shown up. I mean, when we're talking about a ship of that size with that many crew members, we're looking at wreckage, right? If the ship goes down or breaks in half uh, due to a wave or whatever, you're going to have, you know, stuff that comes off the ship that floats, a bucket made of wood, a cork life preserver that could float for years. Something should have been floating in the water that somebody at some point would have picked up in these last hundred years. 
something that washed up on one of the many tiny islands out there in the Abacos. But it didn't. Nothing happened. We haven't found a single single shred of evidence as to what may have gone wrong with the Cyclops. It's as if a giant monster of the sea just p- picked her up, grabbed her, took her, the men and everything on board, and sent it to the depths of the ocean. A very interesting story. So what do you suppose could have happened to the Cyclops? There are some theories, of course. One was that perhaps a rogue wave tipped it over. But again, you think if a wave that size were to come and knock it over, that some of the stuff on the deck would have come off. Some of the stuff would have floated. We have lifeboats that, even if they were unmanned, should have popped up. We have cork at that point, not even rubber. So we're talking about stuff that couldn't get waterlogged or get a hole in it and sink. But the cork should have floated for years. Those life preservers you see, the little life rings, nothing. Nothing on board floated off. So was it a rogue wave? It's very strange. And there were some reports early on that the captain, whose name was George Worley, um, some of the members claimed that he was a drunk and unable to steer a ship. So they said, well, maybe maybe something went wrong. Maybe he purposely beached the ship or maybe purposely. You can't purposely sink a ship unless you're going to blow a hole in it. You could run it into ground, but that should have left a lot of debris. And yet there was no debris to be found. There was a report on that, Worley. They investigated, and it turned out it was more likely that the several of his shipmates were just not happy with him as a captain. But that, that's not that unusual when we get into long sea voyages to have a captain that is maybe not as well-liked as some of the others, but business is business. And when it comes to military vessels, you do as you're told. Pretty interesting. Uh, there was this guy named Marvin Barish who is a descendant of one of the firefighters who was on the board of the ship, and he has spent uh, more than a decade of his own researching the history, trying to figure out through Navy records, ship logs, and anything else, what might have happened. What might have happened? And he's come up with very little, unfortunately. He says it's not like this was lost in some kind of glorious battle. It just kind of fell off the face of the earth. He's not sure if the crew maybe didn't realize how overloaded the ship was. It was carrying a nearly full capacity when it went down or when it disappeared. But that alone shouldn't have caused this, he says. He did say that the, the ship did pass over the Puerto Rican Trench, which is the deepest part of the Atlantic, and that if for some reason it went down in that one spot, it would explain why it hasn't been found all these years later. But that is not really a great explanation. Still, we should see debris. We should have seen debris. I mean, they did look for the ship for quite some time. It was a military vessel. We were in the middle of, uh, you know, transporting important stuff back and forth. And there was definitely, you know, an effort made. It's not like a pleasure craft that went down. This was something that people missed. People were looking for for quite some time. And nothing, nothing ever showed up. He's still hopeful that even all these years on, over 100 years later, that something will show up at some point and give some kind of resolution to the loss of those lives. But we're left to wonder, did the Bermuda Triangle just open up and take a ship right to the bottom? Did it get transported through time or to another place? That's the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. And I'm enjoying this conversation. I hope you'll reach out to me on the Midnight Cafe at Hotmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. We've been getting a lot of emails the first two weeks here on the air here at WBCQ. Hundreds of emails, in fact. And I hope you'll take the time to give me a sound report. How are we coming through wherever you are in the world? And also give me an idea of what you'd like to hear or listen to next on the Midnight Cafe. And, of course, don't forget, if you'd like to be a part of the show, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, we will be setting up guests. I've got one or two lined up already, and we're reaching out. and talking with several other people who have reached out. So if you'd like to be on, if you have a subject that you're passionate about, and it doesn't have to be the paranormal, we do talk about the normal. In fact, next week for the July 4th weekend, we'll be talking about, you know, United States history. We'll be talking about the Constitution. We'll be talking about things that are, you know, almost, almost normal. (laughs) So I hope you'll stick around for that next week. Let's go to another song, and when we come back, we'll talk about some of the theories as to what is going on down there in the Bermuda Triangle. You're listening to the Midnight Cafe here on WBCQ 7490. Let's go. Well, there's a song that probably hasn't heard airtime for nearly a hundred years. That was Azure by Bunny Bergen and his orchestra from 1938. That's a song that's pretty cool. It was recorded in mono. At least that's the only copy I could find of it here. But uh, I wanted to share that one with you. I thought that was kind of a kind of a groovy tune. 
from the old, old days. Anyway, tonight we are talking about the Bermuda Triangle. And we're going to get right back into it with a couple of shorter stories about ships and interesting happenings aboard these ships in the Bermuda Triangle. And this next one, the Ellen Austin, is kind of a weird story. It was an American white oak schooner. In 1881, this ship was 210 feet long. That is a bruiser for its era. And it was traveling from New York and down through the Caribbean when it came across a derelict in the Bermuda Triangle. Now, a derelict is a ship that's adrift. Everything seemed fine with this unidentified schooner. It was just drifting near the Saragossa Sea, but the crew was completely missing. Now, Captain Baker of the Elaine Austin observed the derelict for two days. They wanted to make sure that this wasn't a trap. You know, sometimes they'll feign injuries or just like anything. If a pirate wanted to, they could pretend the ship was adrift with a crew hiding inboard waiting for you to board when they could take over while you're most vulnerable. However, after two days, the captain realized the ship was truly adrift and ordered his crew to enter the abandoned vessel uh, to find out what was going on. When they boarded, what they found was a well-packed shipment, pretty much untouched, but no sign at all of the crew. The captain then decided to tow it, and he was going to claim it as salvage rights. So he just hooked it up, and they were going to take this prized ship, this very large ship, and they decided to do so and set sail together. However, after sailing for two days in relatively calm waters, a squall separated the path of the two ships, and they had to cut it loose. The derelict then vanished in the storm. But a few days after the storm, Captain Baker's lookout could spot the vessel once again. But they realized the vessel was drifting farther and farther away from the position they were at. They turned course, and after hours of effort, the Elaine Austin caught up once again with the vessel. When they boarded, there was still no one on board this second time, but things on board had changed. Now some of the stores had been removed. Very strange. They decided at this point to leave the ship, having nearly lost their own ship in the squall while trying to tow it. And that, you would think, would be the end of that story. But some time later, and a few times after that, other ships claim to have seen this large, derelict vessel still at half sail in the Bermuda Triangle. Makes you wonder, was this ship phasing in and out of our reality? Was this ship just adrift and pirates had boarded it during a major storm to steal some of its stores? I guess we'll never know because the last recorded sight of it was sometime in the early 1900s, but it is an interesting story. I really like that one. Here's another one, the Carol Daring. It was a five-masted commercial schooner, and it launched, or it was out, January 31st, 1921, and it grounded along the Diamond Hatteras Shoals in North Carolina, Cape Hatteras. This is not all that far from where I'm at. There were speculations this vessel was involved in rum running. However, when they reached the ship as it was stuck in these rocks, what they found was a de deserted ship, no crew members on board anymore, all of the crew's personal belongings were gone, as was the ship's navigational equipment, the logbooks, the life rafts, and others. I mean, that was just like everything was gone. However, what's really weird about this is all the stores were perfectly intact. So somebody at some point abandoned this ship in the Bermuda Triangle, and it drifted up into the Hatteras area. But everything was on board except for the personal crew. Now, where was everybody? They never found a single person that abandoned that ship. Did they go down in rough waters? Would it have been better for them to stay on board, apparently, and get crashed into the rocks? But they at least would have been rescued at that point. Strange. That particular part, the very edge, nine vessels have disappeared from that area and never heard from again. So it is a very hot spot for ships to have danger. And we'll go into one more here, and then we'll go back to some more music. And again, we're going to talk about some of the possibilities, some of the some of the reasonable, we'll call them, explanations as to what's going on down there in the Bermuda Triangle. This one is much more recent. This one takes place December 22, 1967, when a cabin cruiser named the Witchcraft left Miami. Her captain, Dan Burke, and his friend, Father Patrick Horgan, 
these two were on a 24 or 23 foot luxury yacht and they had gone out. They were just going to go a little bit offshore. They wanted to enjoy Miami's Christmas lights from offshore. After reaching just one mile out offshore, the Coast Guard, however, received a signal from the captain stating that his ship had hit something, but that there was no apparent substantial damage. He did, however, indicate that they would need to be towed back to shore, and the Coast Guard set off immediately, reaching the watercraft in as little as 19 minutes. But when they got to the coordinates, there was nothing there. The area where the ship had been located, where, where the captain said, hey, we're right here, and we need it, we need help, was gone. There were no signs of a ship, there was no debris, and we're only talking about a mile off the Miami coast. We're not talking about way out in the ocean where it would take hours or sometimes even days to reach. This was a distress signal and a response in less than 19 minutes and never found any sign of the ship or the crew ever again. What makes it even more interesting is the fact that this particular ship, and they don't tell exactly what the design was, was that it was considered to be virtually unsinkable. It had numerous life-saving devices on board, had life jackets, even had a lifeboat, a small one, flares, distress signal devices, all kinds of stuff you would imagine in a more modern ship. But none of them were used because the Coast Guard pretty much had their eyes on that area as they traveled to it and never saw any indication of flares, never saw any debris in the water, nothing, just disappeared. Now, the Coast Guard went on to search hundreds of square miles of ocean over the next few days in case the captain had been slightly off on his calculations. But again, remember that this ship was clearly in view of the coastline when it went down. So somebody would have seen some sort of distress signal, even if they had gotten their position slightly off, but no one ever did. In all these years later, nothing of the ship has been found, no remains of the crew, and we're left just to wonder. What do you suppose happened to the crew of the witchcraft? Really interesting stuff here tonight on the Midnight Cafe. So I'm curious, what do you think? What do you think happened? We're going to talk after this next song about some of the logical possibilities. Crew error, perhaps geological events that could have taken place that would have caused ships or planes to be lost. They're a little bit far-fetched, but that's part of what makes the Midnight Cafe interesting. Sometimes the logical explanations are a little more far-fetched than the illogical ones. We're searching out the unknown tonight here on the Midnight Cafe. I'm glad you decided to join us. Let's go to another song right now on WBCQ 7490. That was Bobby Darren in Beyond the Sea. Not quite big band swing, but uh, something I wanted to cover Something I thought, hey, you know what, it's musical, it is ocean-related, and I figured it was perfect for tonight. Anyway, I am Eric. This is the Midnight Cafe right here on WBCQ 7490, and tonight we are talking about the Bermuda Triangle and the mysteries that surround this beautiful piece of ocean. Let's get into a couple of ideas, a couple of perhapses, right? So we've talked and we've read about a little bit of interesting history of the Bermuda Triangle, whether it be aircraft suddenly falling out of the sky, never to be seen again, or boats either showing up empty or never showing up again. The Bermuda Triangle has story after story after story of ships and people and planes who have met an unlucky fate in the Bermuda Triangle. Let's talk, however, for a few minutes about the possibility that what we are seeing is actually just, you know, normal stuff, bad luck. Could it be that the ship's captains were just not able to perform in a crunch moment? A rogue wave, perhaps, that overwhelms ships of the sea. That alone could be a possibility. A rogue wave certainly exists in nautical terms. Uh, any uh, underground earthquake, something like that, can cause a massive wave. And if you were caught unprepared, especially in the sailing era, you might have found yourself at the bottom of the ocean. So that might explain some of these losses. But a rogue wave wouldn't take down a entire group of fighter planes, would it? One of the many possible solutions to what is going on in the Bermuda Triangle has to do with maybe a geological reason that a certain ore underneath a certain parts of the Bermuda Triangle may possess high magnetic 
properties. That those magnets may have messed with the compasses of those planes way, way back and could have caused those ships to become so lost that they did, in fact, run out of fuel. Now, that wouldn't explain why the ships were never seen again. No, no debris came from those planes. But it would explain why the compasses themselves stopped functioning. In fact, it could explain why many ships would have gotten lost in the Bermuda Triangle, but it wouldn't really explain why some might show up with their contents intact, but crews missing. Another explanation, and this one I think I saw on the History Channel some years ago, and they even did a demonstration of it to prove that its value was there, was something that could take both planes and ships and put them on the bottom of the ocean in a very large hurry with very little warning. That is natural gas pockets underneath the ocean in the Caribbean. If these natural gas pockets were suddenly to rupture, you would see massive amount of bubbling on the surface. But when we create a whole bunch of cavitation like that, we can sink a ship. And we can actually bring a plane out of the sky. It's a bit odd, but it's definitely a possibility. It still wouldn't, however, explain missing crew members. Where would an entire ship want to abandon ship when they saw a whole bunch of bubbles around the ship? Or the ship started to go down, yeah, the ship would go to the bottom, the crew would be lost, the, everything would be lost. And there would be very little time to react, no SOS signals, no no way to send out a flare, that kind of stuff. And even if you were able to board a lifeboat, that lifeboat as well would sink to the bottom. But that doesn't explain those derelict ships, those ones that just show up after floating around aimlessly without a crew for years. It's an interesting theory, and it definitely, definitely, probably (laughs) explains at least one or two of these mysteries that we're talking about tonight on the Midnight Cafe. But there's also some paranormal explanations as to what's going on is it perhaps a porthole is it a place where ships meet a electromagnetic field or a area where time and space kind of collide in a way that there's a slight tear certainly we have talked about on other episodes over the years of the midnight cafe that uh, time slips the possibility where you're suddenly find yourself somewhere else even if it's just for a moment or two Could it be the Bermuda Triangle is an area where time slips occur, except they're more like time tears, a place where you might slip right into another time or another dimension? It's interesting stuff to think about, my friends. So what do you think? I'd love to hear on the Midnight Cafe at Hotmail.com your ideas as to what's going on on the Bermuda Triangle. Do you think that perhaps we're just looking at extreme bad luck? Do you think that it's just overblown, that ships and planes do tend to go down over the ocean all around the world, but for some reason the Bermuda Triangle seems to get more attention? What do you think? I can't wait to hear. I'd love to hear it. And if you want to come on in a future episode and talk to me about your theory of what's going on down there in the Bermuda Triangle, or if you have a story of your own about the Bermuda Triangle to share, well, I'm all ears. (laughs) I love these kinds of conversations here at the Midnight Cafe. There is another story, a real short one, and I'm not going to read the whole story or even go over the whole story with you, but it was from the 1850s, I believe, 1860s perhaps, where a ship witnessed a large fireball in the ocean. That also kind of leads to the idea of a natural gas pocket, except perhaps this natural gas pocket actually combusted. And once it reached the surface, it found a flammable object, perhaps the you know, the the light from a uh, kerosene lamp on deck of a ship causing a massive explosion as the ship both sank and the natural gas bubble expanded. Interesting stuff. Of course, there could be stuff going on that is just totally unrelated to anything related to what we've talked about tonight. There might be something, some phenomenon out there that we just haven't even considered yet. I love to think about the possibilities. I hope you do, too. We're going to go to one last song, and then we're going to wrap this show up. Hope you're enjoying the show tonight. If you like it, well, then be sure to check out our podcast where you can find much older episodes of the Midnight Cafe. Also, check out the YouTube channel. And if you want to support the show, holy cow, this is the first time I'm going to point this out. Farpoint Farms and Farpoint Farms Restorations and Repairs on YouTube. 
That's the best way you can support this show currently. You go on there, you subscribe, you watch a few videos, and who knows, you might just like what you hear. Well, that, my friends, wraps up another episode here at the Midnight Cafe. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. I know I have. And I hope to see you again next Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on WBCQ 7490. I leave you with this, Vera Lynn. We'll meet again, my friends. Till next week, take care. Mm-hmm.